We continue our journey through the Gospel of John this week, turning to chapter 2, verse 1, for the story of the wedding at Cana. Listen again for God's word to us this day. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples also had been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now, draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Now, Lord, grant that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. They have no wine. That's what the mother of Jesus said to him. Though John's gospel does not name her, we know her from the other gospels as Mary. They have no wine, she says to her son. I wonder, why did she say this? Why does Mary point out this fact to Jesus? They have no wine. This isn't the only detail that John does not tell readers of the gospel. We don't know why, for example, they're even at this wedding in Cana. They're invited, but we don't know why. They're from Nazareth. The wedding is in Cana, miles to the north. Perhaps it was a wedding for extended family members, or maybe the father of the bride knew Joseph through the Galilean Carpenters Union. We don't know why they're there. Neither do we know why they run out of wine. Maybe it was a mistake. They had ordered 250 gallons and they only got 25 gallons. We don't know. Maybe they underestimated the demand. They told the bartenders a six ounce pour per glass, but the bartenders were generous and it was a nine ounce pour. Or maybe there were a young couple and too many fraternity brothers of the groom showed up at the reception. (laughs) So they went through a week's worth of wine in three days. We don't know. Maybe they bought all they could afford and they just ran out. We don't know. And we don't know why Mary says they are out of wine. We do know she notices. We do know she points it out to her son. They have no wine. How do you think she said that to Jesus? Was she frustrated? They have no wine. I've been standing in line at the bar for an interminable time, and I get up there and they said, sorry lady, we're out, bar's closed. I have a hard time imagining that. Did did she want to show off her boy at the wedding? Have him wave a magic hand? Show all the folks at the party what he could do? Did a challenge lie beneath her statement? A challenge to her son to show the crowd what he was all about. They have no wine. 
perhaps. Part of Jesus' response includes, my hour has not yet come. That's on the heels of that rude retort, woman, what is it to me and to you? There may be some motherly pride pushing her to the observation, but I'm not sure that's what's going on here. This past week, my friend, the Reverend Jan Edmiston, who I mentioned in the announcements, she helped me see what really might be going on here. Again, Jan is the co-moderator of the General Assembly. She is the leader of, you could say, the legislative branch of the Presbyterian Church, the General Assembly. She met with our discernment team to help us in planning our leadership retreat happening at the end of this month. Jan suggested that what motivates Mary is not thirst, nor pride in her son, but rather shame. Mary does not want the hosts of this party to be shamed. They have no wine. I think Jen's right. You see, weddings lasted for days in Jesus' time, and there wasn't really an exclusive invitation list. The whole village was invited to the party. It was a big deal, a defining moment for every family. Can you imagine hosting a wedding reception and inviting all your friends? The reception begins at 7 p.m., but at 8.15, we're out of wine. Take that shame and magnify it tenfold. And you might approach the shame at stake in Cana that day in a culture defined by honor and shame. They have no wine, Mary says to her son. They have no wine. We must help. We cannot let them be shamed at the wedding. As Jan pointed out to me, Mary knows a thing or two about shame at a wedding. There's only one thing that could bring more shame at a wedding than running out of wine. And according to Matthew's gospel, Mary knew that shame. Mary was pregnant at her wedding. She knew why. Joseph knew why. Gabriel had told him, but who else would have bought that story? Can you imagine the looks? Can you imagine the smirks on the self-righteous faces? Can you imagine the stewards of sanctity seeking out the stones to stone her as the law permits? Mary knows about shame at a wedding. And shame has no place in a celebration of life and love like a wedding. They have no wine, she says to her son. Do whatever he tells you, she says to the servants. And Jesus transforms that potential shame into fine wine and the celebration finds new life. According to researcher Brene Brown, shame is epidemic in our culture. We see it employed by our leaders. It infects social media. We even use it to silence the truth, fear of being shamed, but thanks to movements like hashtag me too, Time is up on that sort of shame in our world. Mark Green puts it this way, shame is how we make people do what we want. We use it on our children to get them to attend to us. We use it as a heavy-handed shortcut in our adult relationships. We use it in our political debates and public discourses. We don't just disagree. We shame those who don't speak or behave in ways we approve of. We express shock and anger and outrage at their core personhood. You should be ashamed of yourself, we say. 
His article continues, for adults, shame can be about everything, our sexual selves, our failures, our imperfect bodies, our difficult past, our losses, the relentless litany of our regrets. Shame can leech the joy out of life, he writes. It is a loop of self-destructive internal dialogues that blind us to what is good and magical and strong in us. He concludes, shame is a surefire recipe for depression, alcoholism, drug abuse, divorce, alienation, and despair. In her TED Talk on shame, Brene Brown, she invokes the words of a 1980s perfume commercial. Anjali, I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan, and never let you forget you're a man because I'm a woman. And she suggests that that call for perfection is the biggest source of shame for women in our culture. And she says, I don't know how much perfume that commercial sold, but it certainly moved some antidepressants. <laughs> you see, shame is toxic. Again, according to Brene Brown, it's the gremlin which keeps us from being who we're supposed to be. It's the gremlin that whispers in our ears over and over again, you are not good enough. And ultimately, shame keeps us from being who we are, who God calls us to be. It blocks us from meaningful relationship with others because it ensures that we never let ourselves be vulnerable to another person for the risk of shame. If we're never vulnerable, we'll never take a chance. We'll never take emotional risk. We'll never face what we need to face. We'll never be who we're called to be. On this Martin Luther King weekend, I wonder if the reason that we seem to be so stuck in race relations in our country is because we cannot have honest conversations about race because we are ashamed of our history. How do we stop this cycle of shame? Empathy. Empathy is the antidote to shame, as Brene Brown puts it. They have no wine. That's how Mary puts it. It's a moment of empathy. She empathizes with that family. They have no wine. Her empathy becomes the catalyst for Jesus to transform that moment of potential shame to transform water into fine wine. And that celebration indeed finds new life. He mobilizes the servants. They fill six stone jars. We're talking 180 gallons of water. They didn't have a hose in that day. Can you imagine how long that took? Stone jars, not clay jars, so that the water will stay pure. That's what they're for, these stone jars, water of purification. They're for washing away the dirt, washing away the shame. And those six stone jars of water for purification, well, they become six massive magnums of Chateau Margaux. This is not Boone's farm. This is not Strawberry Hill. This is not Franzia in a box. This isn't even a nice Cabernet. Josh, not too expensive, but this is fine wine. The best wine. This is the kind of wine that makes Baptists really nervous. This is the wine that will make that party remembered for generations to come. Shame is transformed into celebration through empathy. They have no wine. Grace flows forth in an abundant, extravagant gift, 180 gallons of Chateau Margaux. Fine wine of new life pours forth. Things like that have a way of happening on the third day. Did you notice that? 
this story about shame transformed into new life, it happens on the third day. It's a precursor for the transformation that is cross and resurrection because it happens on the third day. Frances Taylor Gensch, who teaches Bible at Union Presbyterian Seminary, she offered us an overview of John last month. In her book, Encountering Jesus, she points out that the mother of Jesus only shows up twice in John's Gospel. Here at the wedding at Cana and one other place, do you know where? At the cross of Jesus. Francis describes these as the entrance points and the exit points of Jesus' earthly ministry. His mother is there at both places. She writes, the hour toward which Jesus pointed at Cana, my hour has not yet come, finally arrives at the cross the place at which the glory present in his ministry from the first comes into full view. Ironically, in that hour, the giver of the choicest abundant wine, Chateau Margaux, is given sour wine on a stick to drink. And in that hour, the bearer of divine gifts makes his most extravagant gift, the gift of his life the gift of himself for the life of the world. At Cana, Jesus prevents shame from shattering the celebration. At Golgotha, Jesus takes our shame and opens the way to new life, the way of empathy and grace and truth and love, the way that is the truth about life that we know in him. Jesus is the word become flesh, dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. He is God incarnate. He is God with us, God among us, which is to say Jesus embodies the empathy of God for us all. The empathy of God for this world that is so stained by shame. Jesus is that empathy for all of us, God with us, in us, freeing us from shame that keeps us from being who God created us to be. That new life might flow forth in us and by the grace of God through us How are we called to respond to all of this? Ellen Crawford True is my friend and colleague in my preaching group, The Well. She shared a great story with us last year in Richmond about a product called the Miracle Machine. It's an invention that is designed to turn water into wine. Right there on the countertop of your kitchen at home. You see, you just pour some water into it with a few ingredients purchased separately, of course. And three days later, that's downright biblical, as Ellen told us. Voila, fine wine. It can be yours for $499. We were hooked. So were approximately 600 media outlets, including Time Magazine, who reported on this amazing new thing. Over 7,000 people signed up to help crowdsource the funding of this miraculous machine. The only problem? It was a hoax. They released to the press an announcement concerning the hoax. You see, it was a carefully designed hoax to get our attention, to see what we would be willing to spend $499 on. From the press release, the miracle machine is not a real device. It is just a piece of wood. This disruptive program concept, it, it, can include, it continued, was initiated as a pro bono campaign to support nonprofit wine to water, 
an organization that provides people around the world with access to clean water, one of life's basic necessities. You see, wine to water got everybody's attention by advertising a machine that was supposed to turn water into wine. And if you signed up to give your $499, you were let in on the secret and you were invited to make a contribution to wine to water, to help wine purchases turn into water through donations to the nonprofit. As of the date of the press release, wine to water had provided over 250,000 people in 17 countries access to clean drinking water. Doc Henley, the founder of Wine to Water, he said, for the cost of one bottle of fine wine, we provide a way to produce 99.9% .9 pure drinking water for an entire family for up to five years. I can live with Boone's Farm, or at least Josh, maybe. Friends, in a world where over two and a half billion people do not have access to clean water, that is a miracle. Turn in wine into water, fine wine, new life flowing forth. At the close of John's Gospel, Jesus appears to his disciples on the other side of the cross. And he extends his arms to them, showing him his wounds. And he says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And he breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit. It's John's version of Pentecost. And that's our call as Christ embodies God's empathy for a world stained by shame, so to let us look with empathy on this broken world, a world where far too many have run out of wine, a world where billions live in a poverty we could never imagine, where shame keeps too many shackled by the past, locking them out of an abundant future. A world, a nation in particular, where more young people are battling anxiety and depression today than at any other point in our nation's history because of shame. Let us step forward in empathy, be vulnerable, offer ourselves in love to one another and to this world locked in the shadows of shame. That the transforming love of God might flow forth in us and by God's grace through us, bringing new life, succulent, fine wine, so that everyone can enjoy the party. May it be so. Amen.